I am here today with Andy Curran. Andy was a founding member, bassist, and lead vocalist in the legendary Canadian band Coney Hatch. Over the years, Andy has been nominated and won a Juno Award as a solo artist. He has done sessions and had band projects like Soho 69 and Caramel, and has worked behind the scenes as an A&R manager for Anthem Records. Andy has now joined Rush guitarist Alex Lyson as part of a new project called Envy of None. Envy of None is set to release their self-titled debut on April 8th via K-Scope Music. And there are a lot of people out here very, very excited to hear this thing. <laughs> Well, that's quite an intro, Scott, and thank you, buddy. We're we're um, we had a, I have to tell you, man, we had such a blast recording this, and we're we're really excited to uh, have the birds leave the nest and see what people think of this music. Because um, I jokingly said to somebody, maybe we should have a disclaimer on the cover that says, "Warning: This is not Rush or Coney Hatch," because <laughs> right. it's very, it's very different, right? It is. It's completely different. And that was one of my questions for you. Uh, you know, was, was that intentional? Uh, did you go in and say, I don't want to make a Rush record. I don't want to make a Coney Hatch record. Let's do something different. A hundred percent. It was intentional. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it was one of these things that I, I think really where Alex and I kind of saw eye to eye and bonded was um, the two of us uh, are big fans of soundtrack music. And, you know, we talk about everybody from Danny Elfman to um, Trevor Rabin to, uh, you know, Stuart Copeland, all these musicians that have made um, secondary careers, uh, writing music for film and television. And um, we both have a common interest in ambient music and electronica. And so we, we started discussing working together, um, the two of us, to write music for film and television. It kind of spilled over into the Envy of None project and working on that. But um, certainly if Alex was on the call with us right now, he would tell you that all of his thought process behind his guitar parts were to do what he would not do in Rush and to scratch a different itch. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of, of there's, it, there's parts of the record where you can hear the thudding quarter notes that, that maybe I'm, my nickname is the Earl of Eighth Notes. And, and you know, I'm, I'm known for that. But for, <laughs> for the most part, I really did both of us like open up the, the blinders and, and really tried to carve some new territory. And it was quite rewarding as musicians to scratch that itch that we normally uh, are not known for, you know, we're, we're pretty right. much he, he's the guitarist in Rush. And a lot of my stuff is really hard rock alternative. And, and this is not that at all. No, it's really not. Uh, you know, I think progressive music when I when I listen to this, uh, you know, but not progressive in a rush kind of way or a dream theater kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, no King Crimson kind of thing, even it's progressive in the true sense of the word progressive. Uh, it is doing things that are not being done anywhere else. Uh, it's really, you know, the uh, you know, and I'm sitting and I'm thinking, you know, time signatures as I'm listening to trying to analyze this thing and and see exactly how this is created. And it's very, very difficult uh, to really put my finger on what's being done to create this just it's ambient sound. Uh, it, it's it's fascinating. to listen Yeah. To. Well, really thank, th thank you for saying that, Scott. And I think, um, you know, the thought process behind this was um, the it might be one of the few bright things that has come out of the pandemic, being able to to record remotely and send ideas to each other. Um, we did cut a few bed tracks in Toronto with real drummers. And then there's a collection of sort of uh, songs with, that have a lot of drum programming on. But the, the I guess the barometer or the bar was really to send um, song ideas around. And if they resonated with the other members, then it was like, okay, we're going to work on that one. You know, okay. so we would send maybe, you know, a half a dozen riffs around and go, hey, everybody, which ones do you like? Oh, we like number two and number four. Great. Let's start working on those. It wasn't like, should we write a hard rock song? Should we write, well, you know, like I think about, th there's a song on the record called Dumb. And, and I sent that through because, 
it reminded me of sort of like an 80s or 90s Depeche mode, something you would hear in a club late, you know, you might, and lots of dancing going on. And, and nobody went, wow, that, that sounds like a, a, a disco dance tune. You know, we all, everybody just yeah. dove in and, and we made it this monster and lots of rhythmic stuff going on. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, the, the, the bar of, of what we would work on was all over the map because it was whatever idea was turning people on at that time. It's, yeah. it's kind of, and no record label, no A&R guy, no manager, no producer going, no, you can't do that. No, right. it, we simply, I would come up with an idea traditionally, send it over to Alf. He would lay some stuff on it. We'd send it over to Alex. Alex would say, I think I want to wait for Maya's vocal, or he would say, oh, I got a few ideas. And a lot of the songs too, Scott, would, would start as a 30 second to two minute piece and we would expand on it. Okay. Do you do you like this verse and chorus? Great, let's build on it, right? So, it was it was four musicians collaborating, having a blast doing it with no pressure, no plan to release it, no plan to tour, and just like let's see where this goes. Right, right. man, that's got to be fun from what you've done in the past. Of course, you know, I mean, the way you know, I mean, you've been in this business for a very long time, and it's always been kind of you know, deadline driven, uh, or, you yep. know, it's, I need this for the record company, or, you know, you, you have a certain agenda that you need to follow. Uh, so this had to be a, a real great, uh, uh, a piece of yourself that you could share and not, you know, have no boundaries to it. Totally. And, and that's where the progressive stuff comes in, you know, cause nobody was saying you have to stick within this lane. We were right. just, we were just going, hey, this idea is getting us off. Do you like it? You know, and, and like you said, no timelines. We just kind of, it wasn't until we got to about the six or seven song point when we had been sharing them and Alex Lyson called me and he started to become very vocal saying that this stuff is turning out amazing. Andy, we got to, we got to do something with it. What are we going to do? Are we going to shop a deal or, and so um, he said, didn't you, don't you have some friends that are film and television music supervisors that we could maybe just bounce it off and see what they think. So when we had about seven, six or seven songs, I did that. I sent it to probably six or seven, um, music supervisors and they all responded very positively one of them said perfect timing i'm working on a netflix series i want i want the song liar for this netflix series called tiny pretty things and it was that point i think scott that we got a little shot in the arm and realized that maybe it wasn't just the four of us drinking our own kool-aid going this is cool somebody outside the camp said nice work boys like and and then we went okay that all the all bets are off the gloves are off and we're going to go for it and we're going to finish this thing um so that gave us a nice little inspiration halfway through the project that's cool that's cool yeah. you know and i i heard this you know i put it on and i'm listening and i'm thinking you know this is definitely not coney hatch and it's definitely not rush yeah uh, and to have you know you two guys doing it uh how do you you know how do you get on the same page uh you know it's like uh you know was it one idea and then you you, you know, did you expect like you know i mean did alex bring stuff to you and then you added to it and kind of shifted okay that's what he wants to do uh yeah. you know or you know did you i mean how do you how do you start where it ends yeah. up you know how did yeah, it yeah, get yeah. to where it ended up well, it was, um, I would say for maybe 60% or 60 or 70% of the record, nine times out of 10, the seed of the idea would start with myself and Alf. We would, we would work on it, send it out to Alex and Maya and see if they, if they were digging what we, we were working on. And then that was like a Lego block, people putting things together, building it, putting layers and layers on top of it. But Alex came in with, um, with three songs, uh, Spy House, Kabul Blues, and Western Sunset. And they were pretty much um, finished, Scott, in terms of they, they were instrumental tracks. And I had played bass on them. Alex had asked me to play bass because he had done some guide bass and wasn't happy with it. So I jumped in and did that. And then we brought them into the Envy of None um, camp. And then there was a song called Old Strings, which Maya had written on her own. 
And when she sent it to me, it reminded me of kind of Mumford and Sons in terms of some of the, what I would call the more country folk leaning stuff that Mumford does. And I called her up um, and this is a perfect example of how these songs developed or didn't develop. And I said, Maya, that's a really cool song, but it's so far from what we're doing. Like the rest of it's very ambient and cool and soundscapey. And then there's just like, right. there was banjos and all kinds of stuff. And I said, right. I think, I think this one's a little bit too far on, on the left here, but would, would you allow me to deconstruct it? I'm going to give it an enema. I'm going to just deconstruct this thing. Right. <laughs> so she said, sure, give it a shot. I, I got rid of everything with the exception of her vocal. And then we built it from the ground up half tempo and old strings kind of has like, she has a version that she'll probably put on her record, which right. is very Americana folk, which is kind of her lane. Right. Um, and uh, for the most part, that's how the record was sort of conceived, you know? So we had sort of three camps, Andy and Alf, Alex, and then Maya on her own. And wow, what yeah. uh, those are some great camps to uh, to yeah. join together. Yeah. Uh, tell me about this ethereal, wispy, mysterious, edgy, sweet voice I hear. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, Maya yeah. Wynn, uh, your singer, she, uh, you know, and that's another thing, you know, we're getting Andy Kern, we're getting Alex Lifeson. These are two big names in music that we're used, you know, we know it's names of celebrity. Uh, we have... This newer singer, new to me anyway, yeah. um, very young singer, Maya Wynn, she grabs the wheel of this ship and oh she's God. just driving it. It's uh, she is she commands these songs. Uh, it's it's really something. And I was very shocked by that, you know, because yeah. uh, it, she is huge on this record. Uh, when did when did you find her? Uh, yep. had the writing started already and the her addition what kind of direction did that you know did, did that change the direction of the music that you had planned yeah and uh, honestly all those things you said scott i 100 100 agree with you she is our secret weapon she is the icing on the cake um you know the styles uh, are so varied but the common thread through it all is maya's voice and her melodies and her beautiful uh, gift of um of uh, harmony so to tell you you know i think when i met her um i was basically still doing full-time a and ring at anthem records and i had asked to judge i was asked to judge an online music contest and Maya was one of the contestants that was in the top 10. Wow. And so I was um, asked to do a mentoring call with her as a music industry expert, you know, and I was like, that sounds like a pretty crappy prize, but I'll, I'll do it anyway. Right? <laughs> and um, what ended up happening was Maya sent me four songs and one of them in particular was quite different than the other three. Three of them were very much, as I said, her comfort zone is very much Americana folk right up the middle. And then there was this one kind of trippy, weird song with weird harmonies. And I was like, you need to tell me about that. Tell me about that song. How did it happen? I think you need to do more of that. And she said, well, I'd been writing with this um, person and he's not around anymore. And I said, well, that's part of the ride. I gave her some advice. You got to network. You got to find other musicians to work with. And she said, well, can I work with you? I was like, I, I was not expecting that, right? <laughs> but having the insight, Scott, that I did on that song, I thought maybe her the trippy, ethereal, wispy, all the, all the qualities you said might work well with some of the ideas that I was working on. Um, I had a folder on my desktop and my, my studio at home that was very much um, I named it the Auntie Drew. My friends call me Drew, short for Andrew. And it was everything that I, I wasn't going to use for Coney Hatch. So that was the stuff that I started sending over to her. And when she started layering her vocals on it, I was so impressed that I ended up sending it to Alf, who I'd done a lot of work with in Toronto, great mixing engineer, uh, um, recording engineer, and a multi-instrumentalist. And I sent it to Alex. And they were like, Andy, you have found a diamond in the rough here. This girl is special. We, we call her the special secret weapon. Obviously, Alex is the heat-seeking missile. He's, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. But um, 
she is wise beyond her years. We met her when she was 21 years old and um, her gift of, of harmonies and melodies and, and even her lyrics are, are like, she's been here before. She's an old soul, but she's quite young. And, um, and, and like, like you said, I mean, what a layer of her voice. She's meant to be the star of the show. She's right up front. We're constantly, she would say, Hey, are my vocals too loud in the mix? I would say, no, they're not. No, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It's, you know, I, I'm listening and I'm, I'm thrown back a little bit to the, the Pink Floyd era, the animals dark side era of yeah. the very patient progressive type music where it's okay to take eight minutes uh just just absorb it you know feel it float on it and that this record does that and her vocals just are just (laughs) they're just float there uh and it's just so it's edgy and mysterious and beautiful and you know, very haunting like very haunting at times and right. people people have told me that songs like look inside and old strings they're almost pink floydian as you said you know they're very um there there are moments where we get nasty you know we pick our moments like enemy and and you know liar are pretty pretty in your face or, or never said i love you is, a, is an opening track with a pop song but for, for the right. most part you're right her her um her vocals are so special and and i do think that they they make the project certainly sound very current um she's young she's it's a breath of fresh air you know you've got this um that this this young woman that you know uh respectfully could be my, my daughter you know she's right. young enough to be my daughter right, right. um yeah. but but uh boy she's she brings a lot more than your average 20 year old that's for sure yeah, I, to, totally. And I was so shocked. I just, you know, and, and she's like I say, she's not in a rush to get, you know, to the, the chorus, so to speak. You know, it's not a verse chorus verse thing. Uh, and she's just so patient and it just blends so nicely with what you're doing musically. Uh, her vocals just fit perfectly. Um, was that a challenge for you to, you know, you've done rock and roll, you've done hard rock type melodic rock stuff uh, Mm -hmm. for the most part um, in your career. And I know you've done many other things. Uh, This probably isn't something you've done before. Has it, is it, you know, I probably Alex can say the same and, you know, um, was it a challenge for you to find your place inside of this, you know, big uh, ambient sound? Yeah. Well, ironically, um, ironically, Scott, it wasn't, you know, I, and I'm surprised because uh, I think um, I tell a lot of people this, that that the core of where I'm from is a music fan. I listen to so much music. Um, so there for for the last decade, at least even longer, um, I think maybe my first introduction into ambient music might've been because I was a, a very big Frank Zappa fan moving into missing persons. And then as a bassist followed Patrick O'Hearn and Patrick O'Hearn carved this career out where he was writing this ambient sort of instrumental music. So I just started really digging that. And then I just started discovering artists like Thievery Corporation or Massive Attack um, or, you know, uh, Bonobo and these sort of electronic bordering on EDM, but just a very like chilled EDM. And my, I've got two young daughters and they listen to a lot of that stuff. So I, I found myself being surrounded by it and going wow i could i could write this stuff no problem right cool. and uh, and yeah. and, it, and, it, and it's very different than than what i'm known for so to answer your question surprisingly no it, it, it was it felt very natural and it, it was quite an easy transition and with alex especially not writing rush guitar parts he right. would he was processing his guitar he was flipping it like Jimi Hendrix would do backwards and he was putting reverb on and he was cutting them up and making them syncopated and and rhythm and groove was very important to us there's a lot of rhythm um, happening in this record and uh, so he 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 actually fit like a glove in all of that and specifically wanted to 
write guitar parts that were soundscaping. He was said, I'm soundscaping. I leave the traditional guitar parts to you and Alf, and then I'm going to do all of the layering on top of that. Wow. And it's, it, it's you know, it, it is a shock, the, the, the record. And I think, you know, a lot of people will be, will be shocked to, to hear it because uh, it's, it's not anything close to what people might be expecting. I, I wouldn't think, uh, yeah. <laughs> which makes you smile. And I love that, you know, that's, that, you know, that was what you were going for. And it's really cool. Well, um, we put out, we put out the two like liar and, and um, look inside that are online now. And it was like, we're firing off a gun. Here's a little taster. So brace yourself, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> That's great. It's great. Well, uh, now that you say, you know, that was, you, you didn't find that to be a challenge, the playing. What was the most difficult part of, of making this record? Was there something in particular that? Um, yeah, there was a couple of things I could tell you. So, you know, you touched on the fact that that I've been kicking around for a while. And for the most part, um, you know, wrote really all my lyrics and all my melodies, right? So to, to kind of get, to take myself away from that. And I would seed Maya with little ideas. I would go, well, what do you think? I've got a couple little lines for the verse or a couple little lines for the chorus, but I was constantly pulling myself back. I didn't want to treat Maya like a robot and go, here's some lyrics, here's the melody, sing it. I yeah. felt it was very important for her to have her own voice and to be able to stretch. And um, so collaborating, I guess, and co-writing lyrics and melodies, um, that was the first time for me to step away and not, um, and I'll use a hockey term because you're a hockey fan. Yeah. I normally puck hog all of that. That's mine. <laughs> Give it to me. I'm going to keep it. Right. So that, to, so finding the balance of when to assert myself or not assert myself and go, great, she's onto it. No problem. And nine times out of 10, she was, she, her instincts were, were very good there. So that was a little bit of a challenge, but um, the mixing itself, although it was mostly Alfio and Alex that mixed it, we had so many layers on this thing, Scott, that it was really important for us to tr try to figure out the balance of what needs to be heard and what doesn't. And by the end of the record, um, Maya was sending us 60 tracks of vocals. And we're like, oh, my God, what are we going to use here? Right. <laughs> so that 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 where we balance things and how to make these parts read was extremely challenging extremely yeah. challenging and i noticed you know in the, in the credits for each of you uh three out of four of you have programming credits yes uh, you know so it is that kind of record it is multi-layered it's you know very very soundscape uh so yeah that that um, that, that was had, tough that had was to tough. Be complicated for sure there was a song called dog's life and dog's life is um in side b uh, or side a on, on the vinyl and it starts with a bass sequencer and it's so big and takes up so much space we were just like okay what are we going to do with this thing and everybody ended up having to build around it and that was so hard to sign off on a mix, man. But just to get four people to agree on what the, yeah. what the mix was, that was a tough one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, great assists all around. <laughs> for yes, sure. yeah. <laughs> uh, were you ever concerned that it wouldn't be accepted by Rush fans or Coney Hatch fans? Uh, people that are, you know, they're, they see your name, they see Alex's name. They want their fill of, you know, that Coney hat sound a little bit or a mm -hmm. rush sound. Uh, any concern of them being disappointed by this? Um, I would say yes. You know, Alex and I spoke about that and Alex is a little bit more vocal than I was about it. He was, you know, he flat out said, um, Andy, I don't really care. Uh, this, this ride has been amazing and it's not a rush record. So they shouldn't expect a rush record and they're not going to get a rush record. And there might never, ever be another rush record. If anything, you know, my fingers are crossed that maybe we'll see a Lee Lifeson album in our lifetime where those two guys get together. But he said, I spent 40 years plus years in that band and this is not rush. So if they're disappointed, then they should go home and put their Rush records on. Um, I, I wasn't really as vocal as that because, um, you know, the, the Coney Hatch fans, we're still feeding them little scraps of material here with a live yes, album. <laughs> so, so, so it's like, here you go. If, if, they, if 
if they don't like envy of none, that's okay. Um, I think it's it's a much different ride. Um, but I think people in general, specifically Rush fans, are quite happy to see Alex out there writing and making music again. And there's a there's a real heartfelt um, emotion and voice coming back that the Rush fans are just happy to see Alex playing again, and which is nice coming from the Rush community as opposed to, no, we don't like you because it doesn't sound like that. They're just like, this is so cool that Alex is playing music again after that difficult chapter of, of the band finishing and losing his friend Neil, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, that that is the overall feel that I get, you know, uh, forums, comments on the video, things like that. Uh, people are thrilled that we're getting music uh, from Alex because we weren't sure mm -hmm. if that was going to ever happen again. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, people are absolutely thrilled. Uh, you know, you have a programming credit, but you also have a credit for a stylophone. Uh, you don't see that very often. Uh, you know, that's, you know, and of course, for those that not know, Stylophone is kind of this, um, it's almost like a toy. Uh, I may have started yes. as a toy with a stylus and, and a metal plate kind of sensitive plate that makes this sound as you run the stylus across it. Uh, made yeah. famous, probably most famous in Space Oddity, uh, David Bowie used it quite often yep. i think i, I yep. think there's actually a david bowie stylophone if i'm not mistaken so what you know what made you <laughs> pick up a stylophone <laughs> i mean do you have one laying around in the house or how does that happen <laughs> well first of all a good, great job on your homework on that scott because yeah david bowie was the definitely the guy that brought it into mainstream on the space oddity record and um it's funny some a friend of mine sent me a link and said do you have you seen this and it was a link to david bowie's store and the stylophone um the david bowie version of the stylophone was available so uh that happened to be um very close to christmas and i sent the link to my eldest daughter she said what do you want for christmas dad so i sent her this link she said, I'm not buying this for you. It looks stupid. And I said, no, I, 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 I really want it. I really <laughs> want it. Because I, I like gadgets in my studio. I like noisemakers. I like different. I've got a, a whole whack of effects pedals and everything. And I was intrigued by it. And I was intrigued that David Bowie had used it on Space Oddity, right? So um, anyway... Christmas comes, I, under the tree, there's, a, there's my stylophone. And I went in the studio and I started mocking around with it and just, you know, cause it is almost like a toy. You, you, if you buy one, you're a beginner. It does have a, a chromatic keyboard where you can hit the notes, but you can fuzz it out and make every um, right. different sound. So Alf and I, um, and Alex, we all have a, a very sort of stupid sense of humor. So I called up, I called up Alf and I said, dude, I just got a stylophone for Christmas and I want to play it on Dog's Life or one of the songs because I want a stylophone credit on the record. And he started lapping his head off. He said, I said, I want it, you know, Andy, vocals, keyboards, bass, stylophone, right? It was, it was, it was kind of a joke, but it's, it's a little sonic beeping in the background at the end of Dog's Life. You'd, I mean, you'd have to be, a, um, you know, an ant to hear it or, you know, some, some crazy, like, Oh my God, there it is. But I like mucking around with different tones in, in the studio and, um, and I'm a huge Bowie fan and I want, and I wanted to hear what it sounded like. I had no idea what it sounded like. And we found a place for it on dog's life, but it was part of, it was part joking too. I have to admit. <laughs> What's your daughter think? She's got to be blown away that you put it yeah, on. Yeah, she was like, yeah, 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 I go and look. There's my credit. There it is. Thanks to you. <laughs> I love it. It's too cool. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Uh, um, now, you have artwork for this record. You have a lot of different um, forms of the record available, uh, up mm -hmm. vinyl uh, in North America, at least. Um, you know, there's all kinds of cool packages uh, that fans can buy. But the artwork for the record, now I know you guys were pretty, how important was the artwork? You were pretty involved in the creation of the cover, right? 
Yeah, very involved. And and it got to the point where um, I had a conversation with Alex and he was like, man, you know, the record company's asking for finished, finished audio. We got to, what are we going to do for the cover? And um, so I started having a conversation with him saying that a lot of my favorite art uh, work on records is, um, you know, Dark Side of the Moon or House of the Holy. Um, I'm a big heavy metal guy, so I love all the UFO covers. There's a cover, um, Obsession, where all of the guys had ball bearings in their, on their eyes and their mouths. It's just very trippy, right? Yep. But I said, to, I said to Alex, my favorite album covers are, are ones that don't have the photos of the band. They, they make you want to pick up the album art and go, what is this? What is in, what is going on here? Right. What does this mean? Um, very mysterious, but something that is stark and bold enough to make you want to grab over and pick it up. Like I did in the old days when we were, you and I are the vintage where you're sifting through albums and you see a great artwork and, and you pick yep. it up and sometimes you buy it and you don't even know what's inside it. Right. Exactly. So, um, Alex, having worked with Hugh Syme over the years, felt it was very important to have good, good graphics on the front. And um, so at that point, I said, well, if everybody's on the same page, I want to show you some a, a link of this guy that I found in Lebanon. His name is Eli Rezkala, and he's a photographer and he has a design company called Plastic. Go check it out. Everything on this guy's website is freaking awesome. And Maya and Alf and Alex went there and they were like, where did you find this guy? I said, I don't know. I was just trolling on the internet one night, right? <laughs> so we um, so we cold called Eli. We got in touch with him. We asked him if we could um, license the existing artwork that he had with the two women on the front. He gave us the, um, the, the freedom to Photoshop a few things around and take things off. So though, though that photograph is all of Eli's work but we kind of doctored it up and and the pills on the front are like well what are these you know right, and, right. Um, and Alex said to me you know fast forward when all the packaging was done he said it kind of reminds me of Roxy Music like um, yeah. Private Life the, the girls the girls on the cover or the, yeah. the siren girl like what does it mean and that's that's left to the imagination you guys tell us what it means we just love the imagery on it and it's quite mysterious. You have no idea what those pills are. Um, do you want a blue one or do you want a blue one? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, it's great. You know, and I'm, I am that old school guy. And, you know, I remember sifting through the records and the big artwork and things like that. And it was a big part of the overall aesthetic of what you were doing as the event of listening to music i yeah. would sit and i would look at the artwork as i heard the sound so there was a correlation there and i think you know for you to put so much time and effort into that the way it looks to yeah. partner with the way it sounds uh you know i i can see myself hearing these sounds and associating that image with it and that is a yeah. beautiful thing i miss that you know, so there's so many times you're on Spotify or whatever, where you listen to your your music these days and things just come on and you don't know what record they're from. You don't know who's playing on it. You don't know mm -hmm. if there's artwork even to the record. I miss this. I really miss this packaging and, and the Me thought too. that goes into it. Yeah, I appreciate well, it. Well, you met you. You mentioned the different configurations of it. And because the record still isn't out for about another week and a half to two weeks, um, on, on uh, Friday of last week, I finally got something from the UK from our record label and it was the special edition one. And my God, man, I was like, this turned out way better than I could. You know, it's got a little slip sleeve and you pull it out and then it goes into a double gatefold and you pull out the blue vinyl. And then there's a little 11, 11 page booklet in there with all the lyrics and quotes in there. Um, there's a CD with the full record and then some bonus stuff in there. There's a lot of eye candy in it. It's gone. I was like, Oh my God, this is like, this just like, it surpassed any expectations. So anybody that's into collecting vinyl, 
the, certainly the deluxe edition is great. There's, a, there's another one that's white vinyl. That, the deluxe edition is blue. The, um, then there's another one that's a white vinyl. And then there's also the traditional black. So um, lots of different configurations. CDs for anybody who remembers CDs. Like yep. we're, gonna, we're gonna release a CD. No cassette though. <laughs> right, right. And that is happening these days. Yes, uh, it is. It's, it's crazy. It's great. I love that. I, I absolutely love that because music used to be an event you know getting a new record was a, a half a day you know go to the record store buy it unwrap it and yeah. put it on and sit next to it while you listen to it read all those credits that's great uh yeah you know that that we have that with this record it's fantastic um you know i was i would ask you about a tour uh and then i would also say you know <laughs> listening to this record it would be very difficult to to tour because it, there is so many layers to it. There is, yeah. uh, you know, it's not a, a four piece band thing. Um, Correct. Yeah. So, what are the thoughts with that? You know, will you take this on the road, and how will the arrangements go if you did? Mm -hmm. Well, the it's definitely the number one question, Scott, right now. Like um, everybody's saying, will we see you guys on the road? And as I told you, um, from the inception of the project, it really we we never even thought about that when we started writing. We never even thought about releasing the record. We never we didn't know what we were going to do with this material. So fast forward, everybody's saying, okay, are you guys going to play live? Um, the the short answer is we'll see but if there's a lot of excitement around it and and everybody's feeling that um we can't avoid but play some live shows then i think we would entertain um maybe a handful of them especially with alex spend, spending you know over 40 years on the road he's in no hurry to get back out there right. um as the next senior uh, elder statesman i spent many years on the road too so it's not top of my list would it be fun to play these songs live absolutely um the second part of your your question it would be challenging we definitely have to bulk up on a few members maybe get a couple like honestly a couple keyboard players out just to to help layer it in so immediately you're talking about envy of none being probably minimum six piece Maya wants to bring a couple of her friends out to sing background vocals. So there's seven and eight. So they're, uh, we're starting to get pretty crowded up there, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it would be a challenge. I'm, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, what would this be like on a stage? And I thought to myself, wow, that would be really difficult to do. Uh, you know, and maybe even a different arrangement of some of the songs because it's, yeah. they're so complex. I went to see Massive Attack on their uh, last tour where they were celebrating the, the anniversary of Mezzanine. And they had, they had quite a few players and different vocalists on, on stage to pull it all off. Um, and, you know, I spoke to Alex about this because as you know, with Rush, um, with him and Ged and Neil triggering sounds so that they didn't have to bring a full entourage. He's, he's a veteran on, on, um, you know, having a, a pedals in front of you. So when a certain part comes in, you click it in and that part comes in. Right. Um, and he was the first guy to say, if we did some live shows, there would have to be a lot of pre-production to, to, for us to represent these songs properly, but it would be pretty challenging. It might be yeah. fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would definitely be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. For and sure. Of course we would love to see everybody out on the road. Uh, it would be really great. Um, I, I know you got a busy schedule, I'm sure. Um, and I want to respect your time. Can we expect, I know the first one hasn't even come out yet, but was there extra tracks? Did you write more than there what than we see on the record? Um, you know, do did yeah. you like it enough to keep this ball rolling? I would say yes to all of the above. Um, so the deluxe edition, we did in the 11th hour, write a couple extra songs on the deluxe edition and we have a few alternate mixes. But when we were getting to the end, there was a backlog of ideas that we never even got to Scott. So um, there is definitely a backlog of material and we're feeling, we're riding this very positive wave and momentum right now where the goal is just to keep going. This like, okay, we're in a groove, let's just keep writing. So so um, Alex and I have had conversations about just keep the momentum and, and build a backlog of material and let's see where it goes. 
Um, so yeah, there, and, and, and it was rewarding enough that we all loved working together where, um, the, the, our, our record contract does say that K scope snapper has the first right of refusal for a second record. So they were dangling the carrot there for uh, us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's always a plus. Right. Yeah, it absolutely. is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is great news. People will be excited to hear that too. Uh, Andy, it is an honor and a privilege to be here with you, my friend. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, my door is always open. I would love to do this again. Scott, thank you for the time and, and all the kind words. And I would, uh, I would jump on with you in a heartbeat. Maybe uh, if we get up and running and, and some live gigs, I'd see you in Chicago because I'd like to try to get in for a Blackhawks game. So um, that would be uh, great. Yeah. And, um, and, Pleasure being on air with you today, buddy, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate it so much. Cheers, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, let's catch a game soon. <laughs> Sounds good, bud. All right, All Scott. Right. You take, take care. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.